You waited for it. 2023 Financial Planning 101. Brian, I am so excited about this because this is one of those shows where we get to kind of talk about one of the things that is near and dear and true to our heart, and that is financial planning. How do I know, based on how old I am, that I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing from a financial planning standpoint? Now, look, I'm excited that financial media has gotten better. I mean, now you, you see stuff out there, not only on YouTube, not only the podcast, you see things on TikTok, but unfortunately, because of some of the short form mm-hmm. content, it can only jump right into the basics of like spend less than you make, control your debt, mm-hmm. and then always start some type of automatic investment plan. We want to go beyond that. I think a lot of people, let's take it back to the basics of what actually creates the art of financial planning. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be really fun. And we're going to start right there at the beginning. Let's start with folks that are in the 20s. Now, this is kind of an exciting decade because this is where you build the base. This is where you start building some of that foundational knowledge. One of the things we like to continually tell folks in their 20s is that you're going to spend 10,000 hours becoming an expert in something. You have time. Make sure you choose how you use that time wisely. Yeah. And I also think this is because of the exponential growth opportunity. Um, A lot of you might be feeling pressure because you know, I don't have a lot of resources. I don't make a ton of money. That's okay. I want you to take a deep breath, realize you have the potential to take just a little bit of incremental decision making to make huge dramatic differences in your future life if you do this well. So let's think about this in sort of a pragmatic approach. When you're in your 20s, we're going to work through, okay, what you I think, think about from a cash flow management standpoint, from risk management, investing, tax planning, and estate planning. And on cash flow, it's fairly simple because this is the beginning. This is where you start. One of the very first things you want to begin to try to master at this stage is how do I make sure that I'm spending less than I make? Yeah, this one's a basic one. I've shared this. You have to build that discipline that leads to margin so you actually do have money to invest. The goal is to save first, not save what's left after spending. If you wait to save what's left or after spending, you may find there's nothing left. That money seems to run away. So you have to practice paying yourself first. And another thing that you need to recognize in this decade is the dangers of debt. Yeah, this is one where I think a lot of us, because we are poor in our 20s, we think, hey, you know, an easy bridge to get me to the other side while I'm waiting for my income to catch up is to use credit card debt, consumer debt, and other things. That's that's a false sense that I want you to understand. Use the time where you're not having to play catch up mm-hmm. by paying off the debt, but also then trying to recapture all the money you should have invested and you miss out on the exponential growth. Start off understanding how dangerous debt is from the beginning. Be scared of it to the point that you will make smart incremental decisions. Because realize in your 20s, you can put up with about anything. You just need to know there's so much pressure on building that great, big, beautiful tomorrow. So make every dollar count. You said exactly right, Brian. In your 20s, you can put up with anything. This is one of the few decades where you can really focus on living on the cheap. It's not incredibly difficult to get by without a whole lot. You've not gotten used to some of the creature comforts in life, and that's okay. If you can master doing that in your 20s, your future 30, 40, 50 year old self will likely thank you for that skill set. Um, well, as we close out just this part of it, I know we were having a, a content meeting and we found out one of our one of our content creators is going to drive 20 plus hours yep. for a vacation. Whereas now me in my, my, my 40s and, and you in your 30s, you're like, there's no way I'd fly. Not but I, I, it goes back to the point, in your 20s, you can bedazzle your basic life. Still go make the great memories. It doesn't have to be super luxurious because you're still discovering Everything mm-hmm. and newness, the newness of the adventure kind of really gives you a lot of opportunity to still create fulfilling memories that blossom in the long term without having to spend a ton of money. All right. So let's talk now about some risk management stuff that you want to think about in your 20s. And again, the first one is fairly simple. You want to make sure you have your deductibles covered. That's right. It's step one. Brian, you want to hold it up? Oh, of the one. financial order of operations, you want to make sure that if you have health insurance deductibles, if you have auto insurance deductibles, if you have home homeowners deductibles, You want to make sure that you have enough saved up that you can at least cover those items to make sure you can keep your house out, or keep your life out of the ditch. Yeah, I just want to make sure you don't make desperate decisions because that's what sometimes people will get themselves in situations where they have to go do credit card debt or some 
other payday loans, mm-hmm. whatever the bad decision is to get them through the emergency of the day. If you will have your deductibles covered, it really will protect you from having to make those desperate decisions that will set your financial life backwards. It's amazing how many folks screw this up. We know that right now, 57% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. That says to us that 57% of Americans do not have their deductibles covered. They are not prepared for an unknown tomorrow. If you're living that way in your 20s, you need to fix it because it's not going to set you up for long-term success. Yeah. So make sure health insurance, you know, your your auto insurance and all the property type things. Focus on just making sure you're protected because you will be much better served if you know that anything that comes your way, you'll be able to handle it. Yeah, and a great a great tool that we made available. Obviously, we have the free resource. You can go to moneyguy.com slash resources. But we also have our entire financial order of operations course that will not just cover how to make sure I have my deductibles covered, but what do I need to do with my next dollar in my army of dollar bills? You can go check that out at learn.moneyguy.com. You just said this, Brian, you want to make sure you have all the appropriate insurances in place. You want to have your health insurance in place, your property insurance in place, because now in your 20s is the time where you have to start acting like an adult. You have to start protecting the things that you own. And so you want to make sure you're not neglecting those very important parts. Yeah, and after you get through the basics of just having deductibles covered, it it makes sense to also start thinking about building up that three to six Mm -hmm. months of cash reserves just in case you have job layoff or something else that comes your way that's unexpected. When we think about investing in our 20s, one of the big things we want you to focus on that we want you to know is we want you to understand just how powerful your dollars can be. Brian, here at The Money Guy Show, we have this idea that we call 88 times over as a means and a mechanism to show you just how powerful your dollars can be. Yeah, we even have, we can go beyond that and give you a, there's actually a deliverable you can Mm -hmm. go to if you go to moneyguy.com slash resources, actually go see what a dollar has the potential to become. I think if you understand this, you'll not only think about how excited you are for investing every dollar that comes in your control, you'll think about how you spend money because it's going to be much harder for you to have an $800 car payment if you know what that actually means to you, That especially if you're like a 20-something, an early 20-something. Yep. I mean, that $800 a month car payment literally could be costing you hundreds of thousands mm-hmm. of dollars in the future, if not a million dollars. So so pay attention. And when it comes to investing, you don't have to make it harder than it is. Make sure you understand things like index target retirement funds, where all you have to do is figure out how to answer two questions. How much can I save? When do I think I'll need the money? Don't overcomplicate it. Don't get lost in all the strategies in your 20s. Let your money do the hard work. You focus on savings. you would be amazed when your dollars actually start working for you. And, and by the way, I think this is worth repeating because people get confused about this. They say, guys, we like index target retirement mm-hmm. funds, not just basic target retirement funds. We're talking about the index variety. If you want to know who the biggest providers are, it's like your Vanguards, your Fidelity Investments, and your Charles Schwab's. Go check those out because the cost on those things is practically nothing. Yep. And that's where a lot of people will get will throw some shade at us, Bo, because they'll be like, you know, target retirement funds are expensive. What are you guys talking about? And I'm like, no, go do your homework. Index target retirement funds will help you focus on the things you can actually control and the things, the behaviors that'll build wealth, which is how much can I save? When do I need it? And you don't get caught wasting calories and horsepower on stuff that you need to be focusing on how you get more in the bank and in the investments than just getting busy doing nothing. You're going to notice a theme as we kind of go through this 20s decade. It's this idea of don't make it harder than it is. That same thing rings true with tax planning. When it comes to doing your taxes, don't make it harder than it is. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't try to make your tax situation harder. You'll be amazed as your life progresses that complexity will find you. So using simple online tools like TurboTax or other providers can be your friend when it comes to taxes. It's very user-friendly, very intuitive. If you can just answer some very basic financial questions, you might be amazed that you can actually do your taxes on your own without having to go out and hire a professional tax preparer. Yeah, a lot of you are just going to have W-2s at this point, and there's so much online opportunity now to get this done, even for free. Go take advantage of it. And this leads to, Bo, next, the estate plan. Mm -hmm. Now, look, in your 20s, you think that you are going to be around forever. But I just want to prepare you. This will probably be the first time that you'll have your um, a 401k or a mm-hmm. 403b at work, where you'll want to make sure you pay attention to the beneficiary designations so that you are set up. And if you do start a family in your 20s, if you have kids, 
Guys, make sure that you're paying attention to that. But the biggest thing is you don't have to have a super complex estate plan in your 20s, but you do need to put some time thinking about what your ultimate wishes are. That's exactly right. We say that a back of the napkin, quote unquote, plan will likely work in your 20s until you get to that situation, like Brian said, where it makes sense to get a little more sophisticated when you have kids and other assets. This is a fantastic decade that if you can just focus on the things that actually matter, your future self will most certainly thank you for doing that. Bo, this um, next decade is pretty exciting, mm-hmm. the 30s. Now, we like to, to call this the messy middle, because, yep. and we, we do this because it hopefully will free you up to feel like you're not alone in the fact that we get it. In the 20s, you have a lot of time mm-hmm. on your hands, but you don't have as much disposable income. So it just creates this weird situation. But in your 30s, it's the exact opposite. You're starting to make more money But now you feel like all your time has been squeezed out because not only do you have more career Mm -hmm. responsibilities, but more than likely you you, you meet somebody, you also start a family, Mm -hmm. and that stuff is going to all of a sudden squeeze every bit of free time out of you, and you'll you'll just feel overwhelmed. So we wanted to kind of give you the things you ought to be thinking about while you're in this controlled chaos moment, and it's okay. You'll make it through it, and you'll be rewarded if you do it the right way. I love what you said, Brian, right there. It's okay. You are not alone. Other people feel like this. So as you go through this, know that you are going through the same path that a number of other folks have done at the same stage. So from a cash flow standpoint, one of the things we want you to to recognize in your 30s is that your wages and your income may have grown significantly since your 20s. You're likely making more money. You're likely moving into a different stage of your career. Make sure that your savings follow suit. Don't be a 30-year-old with 30-year-old income and a 20-year-old savings rate. Make sure that your savings matures at the same time as the other areas of your financial life. Yeah, so I I would challenge you on your cash flow. Every time you're getting pay raises and other things like that, prioritize actually paying yourself first because there is something I I think I give people a lot of grace in their 20s because you are trying to work with limited resources but by the time you're in your 30s hopefully you're no longer in a job you're actually in a career Mm -hmm. I want you to be prioritizing that 20 to 25 percent of your earnings are going towards working for you in the future. And then the next thing you need to recognize is that because you do likely have more income and thus more disposable income, you need to make sure in your 30s you're watching out for lifestyle creep. It happens to all of us. Be careful as your income increases that you don't let your lifestyle increase and outpace how much your savings and wealth building journeys increase. I think it's so interesting in your 20s, um, you, you know, you're making de- decisions that are really hundreds of dollars mm-hmm. at a time mistakes. Now, they, they have a big exponential benefit in the long term, but it's still recoverable from. I think in your 30s, you have to be careful because it's not uncommon for people now to have $1,000 plus car payments, yep. to have mortgage payments that are the substantial sums of money. Your ouchies in your 30s are going to be much bigger than some of those consumer decisions you made in your 20s. So just be very aware that you got to be disciplined and make sure they reflect where you want to be in the future. To drive that point home, we know that right now the average age of first-time home buyers is actually 36 years old. What happens inside of this decade? Well, if you look at the data... The median home price right now is $467,000. That's a 42% increase since the beginning of 2020. So these decisions that you're beginning to make in your 30s are large, multiple six-figure decisions. You want to make sure that you're making them well. Um, That leads to, because that's the housing, Mm -hmm. the cars I've already kind of alluded to, but I think it's worth sharing some data on this. The average loan term on a new car now is 70 months. Gross. What's crazy, that's six years that people are close to six years that people are doing it. And the average car loan is now, the the amount financed is 41665 The amazing thing when Daniel and I were looking at this stat is, is to find out how much of this is negative equity that's Mm -hmm. rolled forward. So in other words, people are financing for six years, but they're not owning the cars for the full six years. I want you to think about this. When you're making any decision with your vehicles, you need to be thinking about this in decade length Mm -hmm. obligations. If you're a person that's turning over cars uh, in in a very fast manner, you're doing it wrong. These things, I know in the pandemic, we had this unique time where cars actually appreciated. A lot of people are very quickly, just like Carvana and some Mm -hmm. companies are realizing, no, 
we are returning to some semblance of normalcy where these things depreciate like a rock, especially in the first two to three years. So uh, act and treat them accordingly. So in addition to focusing on your savings rate, not making, sh- not making, uh, not allowing lifestyle creep to happen, we also want in your thirties you to begin answering the question: Do I have a job, or am I actually meaningfully moving forward in my career? Have I essentially? solve the equation of what do I want to be when I grow up? Because in your 30s, you should begin having some clarity around what it is you want to do for the next 15, 20, or 30 years of your life. Yeah, I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time with your work family, Mm -hmm. probably more so than even your evening family, which is kind of a crazy thing. And I just don't want you, you're still in your 30s, you have enough time to pivot if you need to. And there's some some crazy stats that we found on this. Only 33% of workers feel engaged at work and 61% um, are, are trying to figure out how they can leave their current job in 2023. That shows that there's a lot of people that do not wake up in the morning feeling very excited about going to work. And that makes me sad because I do want you to have a career in your 30s because if you can have and you wake up with purpose in the morning, I think you'll find a lot of the financial stuff just falls into place Mm -hmm. because you're passionate and you enjoy what you're actually working through. Yeah, if you are in this statistic, figure out a way to fix it. Figure out a way to find either greater contentment or do something that gives you more contentment because you don't want to be miserable because 30-year-old is still young. You don't want to be miserable for the next 15, 20, or 30 years. So as we move into risk management and thinking about that in your 30s, there are now other human beings that are depending on you. Perhaps yeah. it is a spouse. Perhaps it is children. There are other folks that are depending on you to provide for their well-being. And whenever that's the case, you have to make big person decisions, like making sure that you have appropriate life insurance and disability insurance to protect against those unknown unknowns. Yeah, go check out. I mean, if you find what I'm always amazed about is people just don't realize how affordable term life insurance yep. is. If you can just base it off of, hey, if you have kids, when will they actually be done with college? You know, kind of figure out the timing on that. If you need a good base rule of thumb that I've heard a lot of pundits talk about, if you haven't been able to do the full spreadsheet calculation, just look at 10 times your That's income. Great. Add like your mortgage to it, and I think you'll be surprised. It's very affordable um, for for people in their 30s to actually, for a very small amount of money, to get enough coverage to make sure that your family is not left in a bad situation. In that exact same vein, another thing that happens in your 30s is now your emergency fund. That three to six months of living expenses is a non-negotiable. In your 20s, you might have been able to get by by running a little bit lean on cash, but in your 30s, you have to make sure that you keep it in place. Again, because there are other people depending on you, you don't want to be out there swimming naked. And then the, the last thing to kind of close out risk management is, is this term umbrella insurance. A lot of people don't realize this. It's, it's exactly what the name implies. Umbrella insurance sits on top of your homeowners, your vehicle coverage, and just kind of protects you from general liabilities that you might be facing. Um, I've told many stories on quite a few other episodes mm-hmm. about how this plays, but I just, it's something if you've never heard the term, go do a little due diligence. You'll find out that you can get quite a bit of coverage, seven figure coverage for just a few hundred bucks. It's worth you investigating this in, in, in greater detail. Uh, another thing that becomes non negotiable, in addition to an emergency fund in your 30s, is that now you really do need to be saving 20 to 25% of your gross income. We know that for those in their 20s, one dollar can turn into 88 by the time they get to retirement. But by the time you get to age 30, that's now dropped to one dollar can turn into $23. So your savings rate matters so much in this decade so that you can make sure you're setting your future self up for success. So if you're not saving 20 to 25%, this is the decade where you really need to clean that up. I also want to remind people in their 30s, don't give up. I mean, this is one of the, if you've been saving for five years, 10 years, going on 15 years, you know, a lot of people, especially in a bear market, what we've had recently, a lot of people will be like, man, I, I, don't, I hear these guys talk about compounding growth, but I don't see it. This is the point of building up your, what I call, boil, boiling point. Yep. And the fact that if you think about this, to reach the 212 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way from, you know, 
room temperature up to 212, it doesn't look like much is happening. That's the same way it works with investing. But then once you reach that critical mass point where it actually the bubbles start forming, you will be rewarded. So don't give up the journey. It's such an important part of this. But there is, that's the part that where people are getting frustrated. I do want to tell you when happy days return, I think that this is also the decade where you very well could exceed $500,000, mm-hmm. where you maybe want to go beyond index target retirement funds with looking at you know tax location and other things you need to consider when you are graduating past the basics. But even if you graduate, even if you're getting to that point to where, okay, maybe target retirement index funds aren't the solution, I need something more specialized, you also need to keep in mind that your savings rate at this age is still more important than your rate of return. How much you're saving, how much you're putting away should take more of your focus then, okay, what investment decisions I'm making and how am I allocating my portfolio? Because your dollars are still super, super, super powerful at this stage. So make sure you're not giving too much attention to, oh, what's my annual rate of return and focus enough attention on your savings rate. Let's talk about something that's near and dear to my heart from the 16 years of tax preparation, tax planning was. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting about your 30s is we said you're starting to get a little more jingle in your pocket. You're making a little bit more money in your career. You're now... In this weird dilemma where, you know, when you're in your 20s, tax-free growth is so powerful and likely you're not making six figures at the very beginning of that, that it makes, it's just a no-brainer. You choose the Roth option, whether it's your employer plan, you just choose tax-free growth. Mm -hmm. In your 30s, once you start getting in those higher tax brackets, you might have a decision to try to figure out, do I do Roth, where I get the tax-free growth, or do I use traditional savings so I get the current year deduction um, because I think my taxes will be lower in retirement. Don't overlook how important it is to plan this in your 30s. But also don't forget, in your 30s, this is the messy middle. This is the time where literally the one thing that we do not have here is time. So this may be the decade where you do graduate to professional. Maybe instead of trying to self-prepare, you say, you know what? I'm going to go hire a professional. I'm going to take that next step, and I'm going to let someone else do my taxes for me so that I can focus on all of the other areas that I need to focus on in my financial life. Um, we'll leave it to the older guy to talk about estate planning, because I do think this is an important one. As you go through the, the life changes, you start having a growing family. If you have kids, make sure you have a will, mm-hmm. that, because if you don't have a discussion on guardianship while you're here on the planet and alive, imagine how hard this is going to be for who you leave behind, mm-hmm. because you, we all love our kids tremendously. I know it's a complicated and hard conversation. Don't just assume you're going to be okay. Make those hard decisions while you still have a voice and you make your wishes known today. And again, make sure that you're updating your beneficiaries. That was something we talked about in our 20s. That same thing is true in your 30s because life changes. Marriages happen. Divorces happen. Children get born. Grandchildren happen. All of these different things take place. Every stage and age of life, you need to make sure you're reviewing are my assets set to pass the people that I actually want them to pass through? Again, I don't think it has to be super complicated in your 30s, but probably it needs to be a little more sophisticated than the plan was in your 20s. Okay, I want to talk about the 40s. I resemble this. I'm going to unfortunately, be sadly, be leaving this decade in the not too distant future. And it is one of those things where I think we, we titled title this Top of the Mountain because if you've done it right, this is going to be the decade where you get to kind of celebrate a little bit because I, I, you know, I've heard about, you know, we talked about the messy middle in the thirties, forties is the first decade. I actually felt like I had some affluence where Mm -hmm. I could actually go spend money in in, in a way that wasn't just all about how do I make sure I'm saving and not sacrificing for the future. I want to make sure you guys are on the right path with this because if you do it right, it is a celebration, but I think a lot of people will actually look at their 40s if things aren't going right, and this is actually where you start second-guessing. There's a reason we have midlife crises occur during this period. It's where people start questioning their career, their relationships. Mm-hmm. It, it can be a heavy thing if you haven't done it right. I want you to be on the positive side of this so you're that sentimental person that's looking back with some happiness and fondness of the memories and the good decisions that you've celebrated. So it sounds like there's two options. You could be on the positive side or the negative side in your 40s. We want to tell you how to be on the positive side, the things that you ought to focus on. And when it comes to cash flow, you just said this, Brian, in your 40s, this may be the first time that you don't feel like you're broke. Now, what we hope is it's because you've been saving so well that your pot of assets in your portfolio is building up. 
If, however, you're someone in your 40s and the reason you don't feel broke is just because your income has gone up, but you don't have assets to show for that, don't have a false sense of security. Make sure that when you're in your 40s, your net worth statement is where it actually should be so that perhaps you can begin taking your foot off the pedal if you so chose. I also think the 40s is, is where you can focus on the why more because you are fine-tuning your plan. You don't have to keep moving the, the, the goalpost. I mean, I think a lot of people, since you are making some of your peak earning years in your 40s, 40s, a lot of people will say, well, I'll just go buy a bigger house. I'll buy a nicer car. Mm-hmm. But if you don't know the why, that's why we have the Know Your Number courses mm-hmm. and some of the other resources we have, you can quit changing this. I mean, I think focus on what actually gives you happiness with your money. What's the thing that actually gets you excited about planning for the future? Because I can tell you, it's not going to necessarily be the nicer car, the bigger house. Those things might actually be delaying you from being where you want to be in the upcoming next decade or so. And I think the more clearly you can understand that, the more enjoyable those next decades you're talking about are going to be. Because in in reality, in our 40s, Mortality becomes more of a consideration. We start to recognize that maybe we are not invincible. Maybe there is going to be an end to this thing. So we want to make sure we're taking that seriously, both in terms of how we're protecting our family, in terms of the health insurance, life insurance, the sort of things we have in place, but also in the way that we're taking care of our bodies. Are we exercising? Are we eating healthy? Because Brian, you tell me all the time, the decisions that we make in our 40s and that special decade are going to have huge impacts on the quality of life that exists in our 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on. Yeah, I mean, I've been in this decade getting close to a decade now. And it is interesting because I still remember the advice I got in my 30s from a pastor of mine who said, hey, in your 40s, you've got to go down that fork of the road. You go stay healthy and exercise or you just go let it go. And I do feel like coming out of this decade now where I'm still exercising, that I am, I feel a younger version of a lot of my peers. And that's all because it's the dividends of still staying active. Because, I mean, that's something I, I think don't take your health for granted you know, a good part of risk management is keeping yourself healthy mm-hmm. um, because it's going to serve your loved ones best. It's going to serve you well in your career, but it's also just going to let you experience the full part of having a life where you get to do it all. Mm-hmm. From an investing standpoint, in your 40s, you may need to reassess, am I where I'm supposed to be? Am I on track? And if not, I may need to kick it into high gear. Again, we know that $1 for a 20-year-old can turn into $88 by the time they get to retirement. Well, when you get to 40, that $1 can only, in air quotes, turn into seven. That's still powerful, but not powerful in the same way it was for your 20-year-old counterpart. So if you are behind, if you've not been saving the way that you ought to have been saving, the 40s might be the decade where it's time to really, really kick it into high gear. And maybe 20, 25% isn't enough. Maybe you have to shoot for that 30, 35% savings rate in this decade. I appreciate you taking the pessimistic path because at least the optimistic mm-hmm. for me is because this is the decade where the majority of millionaires are minute. And I love that because it happens somewhere between that 47 to 49 years of age is where most millionaires are. And a lot of you are being rewarded for all of your discipline and saving and investing and letting the compound growth happen. This is also the time where you might be outgrowing the basics. Mm -hmm. So so don't, don't overlook if you have started finding that you're more complex than you even desire to be because even though you you know sought out to be very simple and and very organized with your finances complexity just happens to follow behind as you reach a level of success don't overlook that yeah and but don't allow that complexity to cause you to outsmart yourself don't think that you have to make things more complicated than they are you have to start getting into private equity deals and doing all these complex structures the complexity you need may just be hiring a professional, having a second set of eyes, letting someone else step in and help you. Don't think just because you're getting older, just because the dollars are getting bigger, that something super complicated has to be the solution now, even when it wasn't the solution previously. Um, Let's talk tax planning. This is something I find interesting. I told you, this is your decade where you are making some of your peak earning years. You're starting to see some wealth accumulate. This is also when people are going to pitch you with some some crazy IRS schemes Mm -hmm. and other things that can supposedly save you tons of taxes. Don't be dumb. Remember, the IRS is the government. The government is the people with the guns. They can just take your stuff. Don't work so hard for all these decades to make some silly decisions because you're trying to minimize taxes in the wrong way. 
Actually pay attention. Do not put, mess around with the IRS. Pay what you owe. You'll be in a good place. But also use this time to do good tax planning. This is where you probably should be focusing on tax location and the things that really will, in a healthy way, help grow your assets in an efficient way. Yeah, it's amazing. These small little marginal decisions can have huge impacts. A little bit of tax planning can go a very long way. A real easy example of this is just thinking about asset location, yep. not, not asset allocation, how we allocate or spread out, spread out our assets, but asset location, what types of accounts to hold what types of investments. Because one of the things in your 40s you may be thinking about is, man, I know that all these different tax structures are taxed in a different way, so maybe I should hold my assets based on the tax structure that is available. So like in tax deferred accounts, these are your 401ks and your IRAs, I might want to hold in their assets to generate ordinary income. Inside of my Roth or tax-free accounts, my Roth IRAs, Roth 401k, HSAs, I want the high-flying growth assets so that I know I can maximize the growth potential. And then inside the after-tax bucket, that third bucket of the three-bucket strategy, we want to hold assets with more favorable tax treatment. We want to hold assets that are liquid that we know we're going to have availability to. If you can even think through little small marginal decisions like this, a little bit of planning can go a long way over the long term inside of your portfolio. Yeah, without a doubt. Don't skip out on all the tax planning because it's so important. And that leads to also estate planning. This is something I, I think as I've had more success, you would think as your kids get older, um, you know, where like my oldest daughter is actually an adult now, mm -hmm. which is so weird to say, but it, it still means the estate plan actually can get more complex. Mm -hmm. I, this is, and, and I, I was just talking to a client in the last week and a half, and I said, look, a lot of the estate planning rules are going to change at the end of 2025, and you're probably having to make decisions now I would ask you to please go ahead and start thinking about these things because I don't want you to wait until 2025 for us to pull the trigger on some of this stuff because I think you'll find you need to have time to process mm -hmm. some of these big decisions on trust, putting things into revocable versus irrevocable mm -hmm. trust and and just the permanence of the decisions, um, the, the slats, grats. I mean, there's all kind of crazy terms that you have never heard in your life that as you get into more complex estate planning because of your success, this is a good thing. It's going to need processing time, so please do not neglect your estate plan just because your kids are getting older. Well, and you know, er earlier on in your life, some of the really hard conversations were around, okay, if something happens to us, who's going to take care of our kids? Well, now, as you think about estate planning as you age and as your children age, you have to have other unique, difficult conversations around hey, here are our wishes. This is what we want the end of our life to look like. Or this is these are the people or the person that we want to be making decisions. You want to make sure that you have those decisions early on this side of health because you might not have the chance to have it on the other side of health. So make sure that you are at least thinking through that as you age through your financial plan. That's great. Let's kind of um, move into the 50s. Okay. This is what I'm quickly approaching. The celebration or panic. Here, here's what I think is interesting on this is that I didn't bring this up on the in the 40s because I didn't want to be the the downer of the situation. But there is a lot of research on happiness that the most unhappy decade is your 40s. Mm -hmm. Like surprise, I didn't share that with them. <laughs> but now that you're in your 50s, this is actually where you see happiness kind of spike up to almost like you know young adult mm -hmm. levels, which is kind of amazing. So this is one of those points where hopefully you kind of know who you are what makes you happy, and you you want to have that moment to kind of absorb it, do it in the right way. Um, but but I am worried there are some people that maybe they didn't save like they should have. Mm -hmm. They're behind. I've seen some content creators that are actually doing content with like 52-year-olds, 53-year-olds that have nothing to their name, and it's scary. It is a straight-on, all-hands-on-deck panic because you start realizing your mortality as well as your desire to leave the workforce or probably not even desire, just you're going to be forced to leave yep. the workforce. If you don't have a soft landing figured out of what the next chapter of your life looks like, you can see how this could really mess mess with you mentally. So a plan and prepare accordingly. It's really interesting. In your 20s and 30s and 40s, that's where a lot of the work happens. And then in your 50s is where a lot of the decision-making happens. And you want to make sure, am I on the fence to be able to make the celebration decisions or the panic decisions? And we hope that you can make the celebration decisions. One of the ways to help protect that is when you think about your cash flow in your 50s and you think about your kids, 
The idea is that we ultimately want our kids to fly out of the nest. We yeah. want them to be able to become self-sufficient human beings on their own. Well, in our 50s, maybe the first time that we're faced with this, how much do I help? How much do I not help? How do I help them get on their feet, but how do I not prop them up? When you have adult children, the goal is to get them to the level where they don't have any economic outpatient care as soon as possible. Because one of the things that can be absolutely detrimental to your retirement well-being is your kids never actually getting out of the house. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those. I, I was having a conversation with my daughter, and she, she was kind of re re rebuking something I wanted to do for her. And I said, look, I, I said, don't, you're fighting me over the wrong things. I said, if you want to do me right in the long term, I said, don't be part of that horrible statistic. Because I said, everybody gets focused on the, the, the first time you're a millionaire, 80% of these people are first generation. The only way that possibly could be true is that, and we know this, this is, these are actually the real stats, 70% of wealth for millionaires is, disintegrates by the second generation, meaning the kids. 90% of the wealth you know, completely disappears by the grandkids. That's sad to mm -hmm. me. So this is the stage where if you can get away from doing economic outpatient care and let your kids have the skill set with money so that they're good adults with resources, you will be setting them up for success. And I know this sounds like rich people problems, but I think it, this is a truly a bad place to be where wealth is almost like, um, and, and people don't want to hear this, but it is a, a it, it's something that hangs around the, the, the neck and the shoulders of successful children. Mm -hmm. We see so many kids that come from successful parents that just never get out of that shadow. And I think a lot of it is just not understanding how do you pay it forward to the next generation so they understand scarcity as well as the need and, and desire to build wealth for the future. And one of the one of the best ways that we can help that next generation, whether it's modeling it ourselves, are we making wise and prudent financial decisions. And a great example of one, in your 50s, from a cash flow standpoint, you probably ought to be moving to that area where you are debt free. You've gotten rid of all the consumer debt, and maybe now you don't have to have car loans anymore. And maybe even now you don't have a mortgage. Your house is paid for, you actually own it yourself, and you don't have to use debt as a tool anymore. In your 50s, that ought to at least be on, on your eyeline. You ought to at least be able to see an end to your debt life by your 50s or have a plan on how to get there shortly thereafter. Yeah, risk management wise, we want to quickly talk about insurance. Long-term care insurance is something you'll at least go, you know, explore, do some due diligence on and know what happens when you maybe need somebody to provide mm -hmm. care for you. Is that going to be a family member? Is that going to be a nursing facility, you need to, to, to be thinking about those things. And this might also be the decade where you, you graduate to self-insurance mm -hmm. on your life. You don't need life insurance so much. Mm -hmm. So some of your term life insurance policies actually start expiring from their lock periods. And you might be able to let these policies go if you have enough resources so that you're not actually leaving um, a, a detriment or, or leaving unfunded things behind your survivors. From an investing standpoint, in our 50s, we want to start answering the question, is my retirement plan sound? Up to this point, I've been focusing on accumulation, 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 accumulation. Starting around our 50s, we were starting to think about, okay, preservation, 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 preservation over the long term is the work that I've done up to this point, creating a scenario where my army of dollar bills can provide for me for the rest of our life. Well, in order to be able to answer that question, in order to know if we're at that case, we really need to know what our number is. We have a great tool, a great course available for it. If you've not done this, you can go check it out at learn.moneyguide.com where you can actually input your variables to see what is my number? How much do I actually need to know that my retirement plan is in sound, is sound and can sustain me? Now, this is simply a spot check. This is here to help you. This does not replace stress testing a plan or having a full financial plan in place, but at least gives you an idea to know, am I on the right path and am I moving in the right direction? Yeah, I think I think this is a, you know, a great plan to kind of give you that spot check, but without a doubt, you're going to want to stress test mm -hmm. your full retirement plan. This is where you only get one retirement Whereas working with a professional, we've worked with hundreds of people, if not thousands, to try to give them a good retirement. So been there, done that, and can hopefully do it better because you just don't know what your, your blind spots are. As Bo kind of alluded to, going from the saver and builder mentality to now you're a consumer and spender 
it's going to do weird things to you mentally. I mean, I deal with this constantly. The next time that down market happens when you're getting closer to retirement, you don't get to do that default thing that 30 and 40 year olds do. But like, it's all right. I'm still working. I'm just saving. Just save and I'm, I'm a financial mutant. I'm powering through it. No, it's going to hit you completely differently. It's good if you have somebody to help you not only have the analytical decision making and the stress testing, but also the behavioral stuff so that you have a backstop so you don't do something silly that could actually hurt your long-term success. Again, in your 50s, you also want to be thinking about your diversification and your asset location. Is my portfolio appropriately diversified to match not only my risk tolerance, how much can I handle, but my risk capacity, how much should I handle? Is this portfolio structured appropriately for where I am in my life? And have I thought through the asset location? If I am going to retire, if I am going to begin living off of these dollars, do I have liquidity in the right places? Do I know which accounts that I'm going to pull from? Do I have dollars in those accounts that I will be able to pull from? All these are questions you ought to be thinking about and ought to be looking at when it relates to your investment portfolio in the 50s decade. Well, you're also, you're, you're transitioning from get wealthy to stay wealthy. Mm-hmm. It's not the same skill set, by the way. It's um, because a lot of people, it's back to that transi- transition of mentality, but also of risk. A lot of people will think, hey, I'll just keep powering through it. But that's the, that's the part where you can get yourself, you can run up the score after you've already won the game of life financially. You just need to be very aware of what you need why you need it so that you can do the appropriate plan that reflects all that. uh, From a tax planning perspective, as you get into your 50s, now you might be thinking about some optimization strategies. Perhaps you retired early before a traditional age 65, and you're able to do things like Roth conversions and lower tax brackets so that you minimize the tax you pay over the long term. There are also some key milestones that you'll hit in your 50s. Uh, At the very beginning of the decade, When you turn 50, you can start saving more in your IRAs and into your 401ks. If you have a 401k and you retire after your 55th birthday, you can get access to those dollars. So maybe that makes retirement possible. And after age 59 and a half, you get access to all of your retirement accounts, IRAs, Roth IRAs, 401ks. So understand the implications of each of those dates so that you don't accidentally trip over a tax tripwire that you don't want to trip over. And that leads to estate planning, which this is one, you know, kind of as a carryover from the 40s and the fact that you're getting complicated at this point. I don't want you to to overlook it because you're going to need time to process because this is going to be the the, the decade where you're likely going to see words like revocable trust, mm-hmm. healthcare directives. You're going to need to have some some pretty big discussions with loved ones on, on what this means for the future. Asset titling. I mean, there's huge mistakes I see people make where the a parent will just slap them on an account statement or you know just go go down and add them to the deed of the prop real estate. These are mistakes. You need to actually have a, a, a plan. Don't be in a reactionary standpoint where you're playing defense, where you just when you find out you maybe get a a health thing that scares you and you decide you're, you're driven to action. It actually needs to be a consolidated plan that works with all of your financial assets, not just, hey, I, I'm scared about this, so I'm just going to go make these big knee-jerk reactions. That is a disaster Pay attention to your estate plan in your 50s. Financial planning can be so valuable. The path to wealth, the path to financial independence is incredibly simple, but it's not always easy. So if you can do a little bit of due diligence, you can go a little bit beyond basic. And in each one of these decades, you can think about each of those areas of financial planning. And am I optimizing and maximizing what I'm doing from a cash flow perspective, from a risk management perspective, from an investing perspective, from a tax planning perspective, and from an estate planning perspective, you will be amazed at how seamlessly that financial plan can work and adjust through time so that when you do get to financial independence, you look back and say, how did I do this? How did I get here? How did those small little incremental changes I made stack up to look at this unbelievable financial life that I've been able to live up to this point. Well, I I get sentimental thinking about these big, all-encompassing type shows because uh, I I think there's so much that we try to put in our content, Bo, where I'm trying to accelerate your journey to build wealth because it's not assured. When you start from zero and you're on the path to building your your first million dollars, you're trying not to to get distracted by all the get-rich schemes and all the shortcuts that everybody's put out, but I'm always trying to balance the good, prudent Mm decision-making, but then once I get you there to the maximization that a financial mutant would do, guys, we have covered 
every bit of that in today's show on what to do by decade and financial planning 101. I would encourage you, if you have not spent any time on moneyguy.com slash resources, go check out all the free stuff we're giving you. We're trying to accelerate your path to success because, look, the abundance cycle is built this way. We plant the seeds where you actually accelerate and have success with your financial life that you'll not only look at the free resources, you'll go to learn.moneyguy.com and you'll you'll say, hey, they have some tools like the net worth tool, the, the know your number tool, as well as the financial order of operations deep dive so that once you plant these seeds and you actually implement them in your life, you will reach a level of success that you can't help but say, Man, I could not have done it without the Money Guy mm-hmm. Show and all the content those guys have created, and they, and that's the reason we work with clients all across the country. I think we are we're in the high forties on the states. I don't want to get myself in trouble and say a number that's not right, but it's definitely in the high forties. We'd love to be in all fifty states. Thank you so much for letting us be educators in your financial life, and then getting the dividend of the abundance cycle of every everybody wanting to work with us. Thank you so much. Subscribe today, and we'll talk to you soon. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Got Team, out.